Welcome to another Under the Light program, a series where we share stories, themes, and people highlighted in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. My name is John Spann, and I serve as curator of education and interpretation for the two Mississippi museums. Today's program will focus on the life of Megger Wiley Evers, serving as field secretary for the NAACP from 1954 until his assassination in 1963. Megger Evers became the drum major of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Today's program will highlight Evers' life and his fervent effort to realize civil rights for all people. Evers' hard work and dedication to the movement are shown throughout the museum. In our gallery named A Closed Society, we draw attention to some of his reasons for joining the fight for civil rights, like his experience in World War II serving as a sergeant in the U.S. Army. While overseas, he experienced a small taste of what true freedom looked like, which ignited a spark within him to make a difference in his own community once the war had ended. When Evers returned home, he was also galvanized by the tragic lynching of Emmett Till in 1955. Mega Evers worked alongside Dr. T.R.M. Howard, collecting reports and finding witnesses who could testify on Till's behalf and bring his family justice. Within the A Tremor in the Iceberg Gallery, we showcase the work Megger Evers was doing in Mississippi during the late 1950s and early 1960s. Exhibits on the Biloxi Beach weight ends, Tougaloo 9 Reed end, Capitol Street boycotts, Woolworth sit-ins, and the integration of the University of Mississippi all show how Megger Evers was an integral part in their success. A dedicated theater is also housed in this gallery, which tells the story of his life, assassination, and the impact he still has on the state of Mississippi. The Mississippi Department of Archives and History enjoys a special relationship with the Evers family and the Megger and Merle Evers Institute. Together we have created many projects and partnerships to preserve the legacy and memory of Megger Wiley Evers. Some of those endeavors include the acquisition of the Megger Wiley and Merle Beasley Evers Papers Collection, which has been digitized and can be accessed through the MDAH website and the Megger and Merle Evers Research Scholar Program. Now, to discuss the life of Megger Evers in depth, we have the pleasure of presenting Professor of History and Director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Texas at El Paso, and also author of Megger Evers, Mississippi Martyr, Dr. Michael Vincent Williams. Thank you, Mr. Spam. I wanna share my screen now. So again, welcome to another installment of our Under the Light series. My name is John Spann and I serve as curator of education and interpretation for the two Mississippi museums. This program will last about 25, to, I mean, excuse me, about an hour with the first 25 to 30 minutes garnered for our speaker today. Uh, so if you have uh, any questions uh, or uh, comments for the presentation, please put them in the chat, uh, in the comment chat as the program goes because the remaining minutes will be garnered for a Q&A session. So uh, without further ado, and uh, we would like to present to you uh, Mega Evers, the Examined Life of Mega Evers with uh, Dr. Michael Vincent Williams. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Mr. Spann. Um, I wanna share my screen real quick. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I want to begin um, again by thanking Mr. Spann, but I also want to begin by saying good evening to each and every one of you. Now, there is a certain rituals that I have to go through before I begin any presentation, because when I don't, things tend to happen, and so I want to avoid that. And so first and foremost, I have to give honor and respect to God the Father and Mother, to the holy ancestors and to all those individuals who have worked so very, very hard to ensure that the world that they leave behind is better than the one that they inherited. And to those individuals, I offer both my admiration and promise of emulation because it's not enough to just know what a person like Mega Evers did if you're not willing to apply those characteristics to your own everyday life. I think it's also befitting that I give honor and respect to Mr. Charles Evers and the life that he dedicated to challenging injustice. In the absence, I give honor and respect to my mother and father and my undying love and devotion to my two daughters, Ayo and Marimba, and my beautiful wife, Dr. Patrice Williams. 
And I also would like to thank Mr. John Spann, who is a former student of mine at Mississippi State University, of whom I am extremely proud, as well as to thank the director of the two Mississippi Museum, Ms. Pamela Jr., and all who are hand in my appearing here this evening. I'm deeply appreciative of this opportunity to talk about the examined life of Megan Wiley Evers, because this is a person who so profoundly changed the direction of this country in so many ways that it's extremely important that we know exactly who he was and what he stood for. Now, I will warn you that this is going to be an emotional type of talk for me, and I tend to get excited. I'll try to hold some of that down so that I can stay within the time frame. But this is an incredibly important individual in which to speak about. So I've titled this presentation, Freedom Has Never Been Free, Megha Wiley Evers and the human element behind civil rights activism. Because far too often, historically, we tend to think of the civil rights movement in the abstract in terms of events, strategies, organizations, wins, losses, and tragedies, often forgetting that those involved were real people with families who were scared, who laughed, who joked around, who cried, and who, like Fannie Lou Hamer, were beaten, maimed, and violated. And many others, like Meg Evers, who were murdered and left family members to mourn and to maintain a void in their lives that never went away. There is a human element to the struggle that we have to understand and internalize if we're to understand who Mega Evers was and what the civil rights movement was about. So in the time allotted, I want to take a holistic approach to the life of Mega Evers. I want to speak to his humanity and the society that tested it daily. I want you to know, to feel some of what Evers experienced and how it affected him as a human being his responsibilities as NAACP field secretary, and to understand his unfaltering commitment to fighting for full citizenship and the recognition of African-Americans as human beings, what their value was. In essence, then, I'm here to talk about his humaneness, character traits that were installed in him as a child. There is a human element to struggle for freedom and equality, and Meg Evers believed in justice, truth, righteousness, and the importance of one's humanity with his entire mind, body, and soul. And his parents were responsible for that belief and his commitment to it. Meg Wiley Evers was born in Decatur, Mississippi on July 2nd, 1925 to James and Jesse Evers. In addition to Meg Evers, I also had six other children between them and lived in a quiet area of Newton County, Mississippi. Now, both parents touted the importance of personal responsibility, self-worth, and racial pride, but the actions of the father proved crucial to Mega's ideas regarding manhood, familial responsibility, and the meaning of citizenship. The respect James Evers commanded from whites combined with his refusal to cower in their presence inspired Evers to challenge the legitimacy of a Jim Crow system. Both Megan and his brother Charles will remember their father's counsel. Don't ever let anybody beat you, he said. Anyone ever kicks you, you kick the hell out of him. Yet of all of the father's advice, what seemed to inform Everett's activism the most was his father's warning that, son, if you're scared, you can't do nothing. Show a coward some nerve and you can back him down. That mother Jessie Evers further enhanced that idea by instilling in her children the knowledge that, quote, white folks are no better than you are. And she also expressed the need for her children to both protect and express their humanity without apologies for the benefit of the community. And Evers paid close attention. Yet there were tragic formative events that shaped Evers' idea of the importance and necessity of community activism. And some of these events happened when he was very young. The lynching of a family friend, Mr. Willie Tingle, during Evers' childhood had a profound impact upon the way Evers viewed black people's oppressive positions in society, and thus his responsibility to challenge that status. Now, what happened was Mr. Willie Tingle, who was a friend of James Evers and who Evers knew very much about, and Meg Evers played with his children. Well, he was accused of insulting a white woman some way, and he was grabbed by whites, dragged through the streets of Decatur down to the fairgrounds where he was shot and lynched in public. Regarding the murder, Evers recalled that, quote, nothing was said in public. No sermons in church, no news, no protests. It was as though this man just dissolved, except for the bloody clothes. 
But ever the lynching of Willie Tingle brought to bear the absolute helplessness of the African American community when people chose not to resist barbarism and inequality. In a later interview, Evers acknowledged that, quote, everyone in town knew it, but never a word in public. They left those clothes on a fence for about a year. Every Negro in town was supposed to get the message from those clothes, and I can see those clothes now in my mind's eye. Imagine a child walking through this and seeing this on a daily basis. He's recalling this in 1958, yet it happened when he was a child. He never forgot it. It was something that stayed with him constantly, and it drove him and informed his humanity. The military would also prove to be a life often experienced for Evers who had grown weary of the oppression and brutality he witnessed daily, and these incidents impacted him as a man. Yet as a black man, he admitted that it had pained him to, quote, to watch the Saturday night sport of white men trying to run down a Negro with their car or white gangs coming through town trying to beat up a Negro, end quote. These were white forms of entertainment. As a result, Evers left high school early and joined the United States Army serving in active duty from October 7, 1943 to April 16, 1946. For Evers, the military provided somewhat of a break from the dehumanizing actions that whites practice against black people in Decatur and the state of Mississippi and all over the country. Although Evers returned from the military as a decorated soldier with a record of notable military service, he also returned much less tolerant of the liberties Whites took in denying Negroes the right to vote in Decatur or any place else. For two and one half years, I endangered my life only to return to our native country and state and be denied the basic things for which we fought. In response, on July 2nd, 1946, Mega, his brother Charles, and four of the friends went to the courthouse in Decatur, determined to vote. When they arrived, the band of brothers met a white mob just as determined to deny them the opportunity to cast their ballot. Evers remembered this event, recalled in a later interview with Edwin in Magazine that on this day in July, quote, the six of us gathered at my house and we walked to the polls. I'll never forget it. Now, the Negro was on the streets. And when we got to the courthouse, the clerk said he wanted to talk with us. When we got into his office, some 15 or 20 armed white men surged in behind us. Men I had grown up with, had played with. We split up and went home around town. Negro said we had been whipped beaten up and run out of town. Well, in a way we were equipped, I guess, but I made up my mind then that it would not be like that again, at least not for me. Strategy then became the focal point for Evers from that point on. Although denied the opportunity to vote, the stand Evers took that day fueled his desire for social equality, and that passion stayed with him long after he left Decatur. In the fall of 1946, Evers enrolled in the high school program at Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College, completed the requirements for the high school diploma and ended as a freshman during the fall of 1948, measuring in business administration. Here you can see that Evers was quite involved. He was part of the YMCA, the student forum, the Herald staff, the business club, and many other events as well. Evers graduated in 1952 with a degree in business administration, and he and his new wife, Merlin, moved to Mount Bayou in the Mississippi Delta, where he sold insurance for the Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. His work in Mount Bayou also proved to be informative. Also here you see that while he was at Mount Bayou, who also played football here on the first row, you see him the third from the left, number 31, and his brother Charles on the same row, extreme right, uh, number 29. His work in Mount Bayou proved to be also a defining moment for Evers and helped construct the civil rights ideology in line with the values of humanity, race pride, and community responsibility that his parents instilled in him and demanded. The Delta region represented the epicenter of Mississippi's economic power, and it had the reputation of being one of the most oppressive areas for Black people in the state. Throughout the Delta, Evers found that sharecropping system through economic exploitation and physical violence victimized and shackled Black people to the land in ways that resembled chattel slavery. He quickly noted that any man with an ounce of pride who works in the Delta soon wants to do something. These are the images that he saw while selling insurance. These were the poverty that bothered him daily. These are the images of impoverishment and violence that he witnessed, and they bothered his soul each and every day. These are the images that still exist in the Mississippi Delta. He returned home day after day, recounting stories 
of children without shoes, without proper clothing, of adults with nothing to eat, of sanitary conditions, no self-respecting farmer were permitted in his pig pen. He painted word pictures of shacks without windows or doors with roofs that leaked and floors rotting underfoot. These were the visions that he saw. He often would drive his wife past the worst of homes that appeared empty or condemned, carefully explaining that people, quote, live in there, human beings, people like you and me. These were the visions, thoughts, and ideas that haunted him daily. They disturbed his humanity and kept him going day after day. It was Evers who said, quote, every time I think about my kids and their innocence, I wonder how the whites can make the youngsters suffer so. I guess that thought keeps me in NAACP work. Although Evers recognized the awful conditions Delta sharecroppers endured, he never accepted the finality of it. He always treated the people he met with respect. He ate in their homes. He played with their children. He provided them with goods and money when he could. He was determined to open their eyes to a reality that portrayed Black men and women as more than work animals or impoverished beings with no future or past. He spoke to the sharecroppers he met of the courage and vision of Marcus Garvey the eloquence of Frederick Douglass, the tenacity and drive of Harriet Tubman, and the admirable qualities of other black heroes they may not have known. And when they wanted to escape, he worked with them as well. When they wanted to flee this area, he helped them escape sometime in the middle of the night, sometimes hiding people in empty caskets to get them over to Tennessee where they then went north. And he also stood up for their economic well-being. This man's humanity guided every single thing that he did. In 1952, Evans and the leaders of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership organized an economic boycott against white gas station owners in Mount Bayou who gladly accepted black dollars but refused those same customers' use of their restrooms. Evans was instrumental in convincing individuals to risk their lives and livelihood to boycott these businesses until change occurred. And to show their solidarity, individuals displayed bumper stickers like the one sitting here that said, quote, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom, end quote. Merle Evers will call that, quote, as time went by, Mega and I would see these little bumper stickers with the words on usually beat up automobiles of Delta Negroes. It may sound silly, but even that sort of protest required a considerable amount of courage, end quote. The boycott proved an effective strategy as white stations began installing restrooms for black customers to offset mounting economic losses. This proved to be an economic blueprint for Evers. And keep in mind, this is about three years before the Montgomery bus boycott. By 1953, Evers proved more determined than ever to challenge Mississippi's practice of segregation, but particularly denying Negroes the right to attend its white colleges and universities. And on July 16, January 16, 1954, Evers submitted his application for admittance to the University of Mississippi Law School. Yet despite his qualifications, members of the Mississippi's Institution of Higher Learning met on September 16th and rejected his application. Yet despite this rejection, his public stance brought him to the full attention of the NAACP who was looking for a man of his courage to represent them in the state. He officially joined the administrative team of the NAACP in December 1954 as field secretary for the state of Mississippi. Now as field secretary, Evers was responsible for investigating brutalities whenever and wherever they occurred, increasing NAACP memberships, building NAACP chapters, and exposing the social political problems and brutalities of Mississippi to the nation. Yet it will be his investigation of the brutal murders that took its toll in 1955 seemed overbearing in this regard. On May 7, 1955, Reverend George Lee, on his way home, a car pulled up beside him and fired a shotgun blasts into it, his face which tore off part of his face simply because he was advocating that black people vote. Same point, Mr. Lamar Smith, August 13, 1955, was shot in broad daylight on the courthouse steps because he advocated that black people use the absentee ballot as a means of voting. He had no act of violence assaulted the sensibilities of Evers in the black community in Mississippi and the nation at large in the August lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Lewis Till. On August 28, 14-year-old Till was brutally murdered and later Jet Magazine published pictures of the gruesome state of his body to a horrified nation. Evers again investigated this atrocity as he had done the other two as well. Regarding Evers' involvement, Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett's mother, acknowledged that, quote, she was grateful for his commitment 
and his compassion. He had been really moved by Emmett's murder. He was the one who had done the initial investigation to brief the NAACP head office, end quote. Evers physically cried when finding out what had happened to Till. For Evers, such investigations continued to mount. On December 3rd, 1955, Evers also investigated the murder of gas station attendant Clinton Melton, who was shot to death by white patron Elma Kimball in Glendora, Mississippi, for filling up his car with gas. Kimball later argued that he only wanted $2 worth. He left the station and came back and killed Melton. Hmm. Evers had to endure this as well. Melton left a wife, Beulah Melton, and four small children, ages five, three, two, and five months old, who Evers noted, quote, were left fatherless by this fiendish killing. The experience of this investigation, he continued, shall be of long memory. Ms. Beulah Melton, before the trial could occur, a car ran off the road, road many said in suspicious circumstances, and she drowned in the river. Imagine carrying the weight of these kinds of images memories and pain that continuously replicated themselves with new faces and unimagined horrors. There is a human element to the struggle for freedom and equality and ever shouldered it every day of his life. He also remained very much aware of what was happening across the country and not just within Mississippi's 82 counties. He worked hard to develop partnerships that were both publicized and aid the Mississippi movement and he often did so against the directives of the NAACP leadership. He was being pulled in many different directions. In June of 1956, Evans intended the NAACP's 47th annual meeting in San Francisco, California. While here, Evans endorsed Martin Luther King's leadership and direct action tactics practiced in Montgomery, while the NAACP as a whole had not yet done so. Evans forced the hand of Roy Wilkins, NAACP Executive Secretary, and the NAACP leadership by gathering together a number of delegates who met in his hotel room and they hammered out a three page resolution supporting the Montgomery bus boycott and the leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. And the group planned to deliver the resolution on the convention floor the very next day. Yet in order to avoid a runaway convention, the NAACP leadership reluctantly agreed to support the boycott by way of the legal defense fund assuming litigation responsibilities associated with the boycott. Wilkins also presented a resolution of his own before the convention stating that the NAACP would, quote, give the most careful consideration to nonviolent resistance as carried out in Montgomery, Alabama and Tallahassee, Florida for possible inclusion in our expanding program for civil rights. It's important to note that in less than a year after the Lee Smith, Till and Melton murders, Evers had met Martin Luther King Jr., endorsed his leadership and strategies and convinced a contingent of NAACP delegates and the NAACP as a whole to formalize their support for direct action by resolution. The leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. and the entire Montgomery movement impressed Mega Evers and he took a real interest in what was going on in Montgomery, Alabama. So much so that on December 9th, 1956, he traveled to Montgomery for the closing session of the Institute of Nonviolence and Social Change. While in Montgomery, Evers met with community leaders such as Dr. Joseph H. Jackson and Reverend Vernon Johns and requested assistance. He extended invitation for Reverend Jackson to come to speak at a mass meeting in Jackson the next year, an invitation he also expanded onto Dr. King. Evers' participation in meeting with various Alabama leaders was successful as evident by Martin Luther King's admission in a letter to Evers that, quote, it was a real pleasure having you in Montgomery yesterday. Your presence added much to the success of our meeting. You have my prayers and best wishes for continued success as you continue your struggle against the forces of evil and injustice in the state of Mississippi. Evers in many instances took a direct approach to challenging the Jim Crow system, and he was making key connections nationwide. One of those directors happened on March 11, 1958, when Evers purchased a Trailways bus ticket from Meridian to Jackson. When he got on the bus, he sat in the front behind bus driver G.B. Shelton, who ordered him to the back of the bus, and Evers refused. As a result, Shelton stopped the bus, summoned the police who took Evers off, spoke to him, but let him go back on. And when he got back on, he found another seat right at the front and manned that seat all the way back to Jackson. Despite the efforts of a cab driver who stopped the bus, got on, went to Evers, and punched him repeatedly in the face. Evers' refusal to move to the back of the bus received national attention as news outlets such as the Birmingham News and the Pittsburgh Courier 
reported Everett's personal stance against white supremacy. Remember, this is 1958, three years before the Freedom Rise. A few months later, Everett reminded an audience that in the fight for civil rights that neither he nor Negroes as a collective could afford to, quote, cease to press forward relentlessly until every vestige of segregation and discrimination in America becomes annihilated. For Mega Evers, the only place for him to operate was the state of Mississippi. This, in fact, was home for him. And he felt, felt the responsibility, as his parents had laid out, to exact change in the state. And this was a responsibility that he could not shirk. In 1958, a magazine published an interview with Mega Evers titled, Why I Live in Mississippi. Here, Evers maintained that Mississippi represents, quote, home. It is a part of the United States, and whether the whites like it or not, I don't plan to live here as a parasite. The things that I don't like, I will try to change. Those things did not, that he did not like would take on greater intensity with the lynching of Max Charles Parker. Accused of raping a white woman, Parker was arrested and jailed in February 1959. And on April 24th, a white mob in Poplarville abducted him from his jail cell, beat him with both intention rage, drove him to the Louisiana border, shot him twice in the chest, and dumped his body in the Pearl River. Evers used the incident to strengthen his resolve and to renew his commitment to stay and fight in Mississippi. This is what he saw. And when you think about the investigation, what does this do to your humanity? He finally told his wife that, quote, somebody's going to pay for this and I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay here and fight until someone does the same thing to me. Evers took on that pain and anguish of the people who suffered, and he drove his activism and informed his humanity. He was forever on the move, attending to the needs of the people who needed him. The following year, Evers played a key role in both advising and helping organize events in Biloxi, Mississippi. Evers helped organize the Biloxi branch of the NAACP and to marshal community members to organize against residential segregation. He also assisted Dr. Gibbon Mason with organizing a series of challenges to beat segregation. A weighed in protest that happened on April 24, 1960, however, witnessed police officers and white residents brutally attacking and beating peaceful waders. Evers kept a close watch on what was happening in Biloxi and showed Mason and others how to gather affidavits from victims of white violent responses to their weighed in protests. The following year, Evers was back in Biloxi, helping parents to desegregate area schools, something that he was doing in Jackson as well, including enrolling his own children. He proved to be instrumental in assisting with segregation challenges in Biloxi, as he was with injustices happening in other cities in the state. For Evers, economic boycotts proved an effective strategy for getting the attention of white society. He spent a great deal of time around young people explaining their responsibility to challenge the system and assisting them in that process, that connection was never more evident than what happened on March 27, 1961. On March 27, nine students from two Google College went to George Washington Carver Branch Library for Negroes and requested books that they sure that they did not have. Upon verification that the books were unavailable, the students proceeded to the Jackson Public Library on State Street and entered the white-only facility, pulled books, sat down, and began reading. Reading participant James C. Bradford acknowledged that the group knew that they would be arrested, but believed, quote, the library would be a pretty good project. After all, it was supported by tax dollars mainly, and we could not go, end quote. The students were later arrested when they refused police orders to ex exit the building, as you can see here. Yet Evans was not in the dark about the planned protest. In fact, he knew about the impending reading beforehand and had met regularly with the students and discussed various strategies. He also notified some members of the press in advance of the reading so that the student protests would receive media coverage. What Evans noticed is that, quote, our long range goal is to make it possible for Negroes to go to the city library without difficulty. This is a part of our campaign to eliminate segregation in Jackson and throughout the state of Mississippi. These indicated his further moves toward direct action tactics and away from complete reliance upon the judiciary. Evers constantly worked with young people in their efforts to resist injustice, and a lot of that work was behind the scenes. The following year, Evers helped institute another economic boycott of Capitol Street. The boycott of downtown businesses on April 10, 1960, however, led by Evers, community leaders, and students from Tougaloo, Campbell, and Jackson State, had also been a successful endeavor as reported 70% of the people participated in the boycott. 
And during the fall of 1962, the North Jackson NAACP Youth Council again initiated a far-flung boycott of stores along Capitol Street as well, with ever support, assistance in planning, and assistance overall. By November, two group students were committed to a boycott of Capitol Street targeting over 100 businesses. And this is where Evers worked extremely hard to make sure that bail money was available for these individuals. But I also want you to understand what he's saying and how he's speaking about this particular boycott. Don't shop for anything on Capitol Street. Let's let the merchants down on Capitol Street feel the economic pinch. Let me say this to you. I had one merchant to call me, and he said, uh, I want you to know that I've talked to my national office today, and they want me to tell you that we don't need nigger business. These are stores that help to support the White Citizens Council, the council that is dedicated to keeping you and I second-class citizens. Now, finally, ladies and gentlemen, We'll be demonstrating here until freedom comes to Negroes here in Jackson, Mississippi. And so you see his dedication here. He's very clear about what he's doing and people are listening to him. And he has um, this type of ability to rally people around him. And this goes on. This march goes on until 1963 as well. Evers also traveled to all parts of the state to encourage groups fighting for freedom and made connections between their fight and the struggle happening in Jackson, Mississippi. I also want you to hear what he says here. And you can see how he's making those connections. Grammarly is your personal writing assistant for clear emails, confident messages, stronger essays, and Mr. Megger Evans from Jackson, he's the state field secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mr. Megger Evans. Thank you very much, Mr. McDo. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very good to see the number of persons out here tonight that are. And certainly this indicates that we are ready for freedom and we're ready to march for it. I just want to say to you here tonight that the reason I'm up here is because you have given us inspiration in Jackson. And we're going to go back to Jackson, South Mississippi and all over Mississippi and fight for freedom as you're fighting for it here in Greenwood. All we want you to do is keep going with this fight for freedom. And as we stick together here, as you feel the pains of dogs here in Greenwood, we'll feel them in Jackson. And if we feel them in Jackson, you feel them here. And when we get this unity, ladies and gentlemen, nothing can stop us. We're going to win this fight for freedom. Thank you very much. Ready to march for. That was his dedication. He said, we are all connected. And when we get this unity, he says, we're going to win this fight for freedom. And he's doing this all over the state and the country as well. In 1963, Evers continued to ramp up his direct action against racism and oppression in much more public forms. On May 20th, 1963, Evers appeared on television sets across Jackson in repudiation of Jackson Mayor Alan Thompson's rosy depiction of race relations in Jackson. And he maintained that from the beginning to end of what the Negro sees around him and his reality were two very different things. He cautioned the conservative leadership that the world has moved forward in the past 20 years. Racial concepts have changed. Many Southern communities have changed. Tonight, the Negro plantation worker in the Delta knows from his radio and television what happened today all over the world. He knows what black people are doing and he knows what white people are doing. He can see on the six o'clock news screen in the picture of a three o'clock bike by a police dog. He knows about the new free nations in Africa, and he knows that a Congo native can be a locomotive engineer, but in Jackson, he cannot even drive a garbage truck. He sees black prime ministers and ambassadors, financiers and technicians. Then he looks about his home community, and what does he see? To quote our mayor in this progressive, beautiful, friendly, prosperous city with an exciting future. He sees a city where Negro citizens are refused admitted to the city auditorium and the Coliseum. His children refuse a ticket to a good movie in a downtown theater. His wife and children refuse service at a lunch counter in a downtown store where they trade. Students refuse the use of the main public libraries, parks, playgrounds, and other tech-supported recreational facilities. He also spoke about what Black people wanted. Of course, he wants to get rid of racial segregation in Mississippi life because he knows it has not been good for him nor for the state. He knows that segregation is unconstitutional and illegal, but whether Jackson and the state choose change or not, the years of change are upon us. 
in the racial picture, things will never be as they once were. Here in Jackson, we can recognize the situation and make an honest effort to bring fresh ideas and new methods to bear, or we can have what Mayor Thompson called turbulent times. If we choose this latter course, the turbulence will come, not because of so-called agitators or presence or absence of the NAACP, but because the time has come for change and certain citizens refuse to accept the inevitable. Evans warned state officials that the social and political climate had changed as Black Mississippi is no longer felt separate from the national movement and derive strength from those struggling across the country. Quote, he said, Jackson can change if it wills to do so. If there should be resistance, how much better to have turbulence to affect improvement rather than turbulence to maintain a stand pat policy, end quote. Nine days later, a firebomb was thrown upon his porch. During the final months of his life, Evers became more and more disillusioned with the NAACP's lack of willingness to engage direct action tactics. Between May and June 1963, particularly, he made the decision to tackle racism head on without reservations, which put him further at odds with the NAACP leadership. His growing desire to employ the tactics and assistance of other civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and others underscored his growing discontent with the procedural constraints of the national NAACP. And toward the end of his life, his wife, Marla Evers Williams, recalled that Mega, quote, had all but made up his mind to lead the NAACP and to help start his own organization. With Evers' now more public persona, whites heard and saw him speaking publicly about the goals, strategies, justification, and resolve Black people had toward creating meaningful social and political change. This, of course, made it more difficult for those around him to provide the sufficient protection needed. The consequences of that lack of protection will become woefully apparent during the early morning hours of June 12. Around 12.20 a.m. on June 12, 1963, Meg Evers pulled his Oldsmobile into the driveway as he had done countless times before. This is what he's coming home to. This is what's on his mind at this point. This is how the people who see him and love him remember him. We're talking about the humanity that goes along with this. This is the man who they knew. His wife, Merle Evers, had allowed the children to wait up for him. His son, Daryl, heard the car approach first and excitedly announced, here comes daddy. He loved his wife and children. He spent as much time as he could, and he played with them every chance he got, and they adored and loved him to no end. On June 7th, Evers had publicly proclaimed that, quote, I love my children and I love my wife with all my heart, and I would die and die gladly if that would make a better life for them, end quote. That morning, however, his wife and children heard the automobile engine shut off and the familiar sound of the car door opening. Yet this morning, things would be different. As all familiar ass disappeared at the early morning airfield with an unfamiliar sound of a piercing gunshot. Mega Wiley Evans at the age of 37 had been shot in the back by white supremacist Byron Della Beckwith with a model 1917 30-06 caliber infield high power rifle. Despite the extended severity of his injury, Evans had managed to pull himself along the carport toward the side of the house, still tightly holding his keys, as his wife remembered, as if he was, quote, trying to come home, end quote. Surrounded by his wife, concerned neighbors, friends, and his children who screams of, please, daddy, get up. He undoubtedly heard individuals present laid Mega on his daughter Rena's mattress and placed him in the back of the neighbor's station wagon. Here, Mega Evers continued struggling, yelling for those around him on the way to the hospital to sit me up. And his final words, turn me loose. He would not recover. What the movement lost that day is immeasurable, but what the Evers family lost was and continues to be devastating and immediate. Throughout his life, as I conclude, Evers remained a man wedded to devise and effective strategies for every situation. His continuous search for the best ways, means, and strategies to help change society for the better remains one of the many lessons he taught. It remained lessons derived from the human element of his life and activism. These characteristics also helped define his meaning and importance to the civil rights movement in Jackson, in Mississippi and the nation at large, and the need for continued struggle. He viewed the struggle for civil rights not as a one-dimensional entity, but a multi-sided quandary whose solution depended upon multiple strategies. But the most important strategy for Evers lay in the hearts and minds of those who would carry the torch for future generations and the questions that future generations would inevitably ask about their own participation in the struggles of your time and place. Evers noted that in the final analysis, but let it not be said in the final analysis, when history will only record these glorious moments and when your grandchildren will inevitably ask, 
granddaddy, and I would add grandmother, what role did you play in helping to make us free men and free women? Did you actively participate in the struggle or was your support only a moral one? Certainly each person here and man in particular should be in a position to say, I was active in the struggle from all phases for your unrestricted privileges as an American. This is whoever's was, this what guided his humanity. This idea of fighting for the rights and privileges of us as human beings. And that falls upon us today. If we are to truly understand who Evers was and what the movement meant, then we've got to understand that we also stand on his shoulders. And that is a privileged position that has an enormous amount of responsibility that goes with it. Mega Wallet Evers is civil rights activist. And I certainly do thank you. It uh, plainly, that was a very thorough understanding of one of, like we said, one of our heroes uh, of the state of Mississippi and mm -hmm. uh, should be a national hero. He's a national treasure, uh, Mega Wiley Evers. Uh, we're going to go into Q&A session now. Um, so viewers on Facebook Live, if you have any questions about Mega Evers, if you have any questions for Dr. Williams, if you have any questions for um, about his presentation or his book, Mega Everest, Mississippi Martyr, please put it in the chat. But uh, I'm going to start off by just kind of mentioning some things that you had said in your uh, presentation. Um, you, you, you said something that I didn't know uh, about. You said that towards the end uh, of, of his, I guess, towards the end of his life, he was very uh, estranged with the NAACP, and I knew that, but I didn't know that he was planning to leave and start his own organization. So could you kind of go more into that, uh, give a little more explanation of that? Yes, because toward the end of his life, there was a great deal of tension between him um, and the NAACP leadership for the simple fact that the NAACP wanted to slow things down in Mississippi and Evers did not. And so that back and forth, and remember, he's been pulled in different directions too by the young people. Um, SNCC is in Mississippi as well. You got CORE who's there. You got these young people who are actively engaged in the civil rights struggle, and he is with them constantly. And he's a head there. So he also, his very nature, wants to push things um, as well. And so toward the end, there became this estranged relationship. And the NAACP, too, at this point, was considering firing him from that position. So by the time he was about to die, I'm um, about to be assassinated, these are the things that he was struggling with. Right. Gotcha. And so this idea of, of going out on his own so maybe that he can, can better involve the kind of ideas that he wanted to work with the type of people that he wanted to work with was something that was continuously on his mind toward the end of his life. Got gotcha. you. Um, I was, I guess I was just thinking like during that time, Roy Wilkins was a, a, the major leader of the national, uh, national office, correct, of the NAACP. And... I just, there's a lot of pictures of him and Mega Evers in Mississippi, you know, doing boycotts and stuff. But um, I just wonder how those conversations were. Like what you what you mentioned, uh, you have someone with actual eyes and, and boots on the ground and actually seeing lynchings and of Mac Charles Parker. And it, it's Clinton Melton is one that always sits with me. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned him. Um, just so many things that he was seeing and reporting and he was actually in it. And you have someone or people who are outside of it telling you to slow down. I'm pretty sure that was very frustrating. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really was because, and keep in mind, he had a great deal of respect for Rob Wilkins and Ruby Hurley and all the leadership of the NAACP. He had been with them for a while, so he had a great deal of respect for them. But what was going on in Mississippi, as you say, he had a, a, a on the ground view of, of the atrocities that's what happened. When you think about, and that's why I want to talk about the human element of this, when you start talking about investigating these murders, time and time again, but Reverend Lee, Smith, Emmett Till, you know, all these individuals that he's seeing, and remember, he's seeing the state of these bodies. And so he's telling about these are things, things are gonna to have to change. We're gonna to have to switch our tactics, which is what he was involved with, Martin Luther King and others as well. But the NWCB leadership didn't always agree with that. And we really wanted to kind of slow down and go through the, judici uh, the judiciary way as well. And so those relationships and those discussions became, this is what I think we need to do. And Roe Wilkins said, well, okay, I can support that to an extent. But overall, 
you the field secretary, and so you need to kind of follow our directives. So as things started heating up from 61 to 63, those conversations became a lot much more detailed and a lot much more strained. Gotcha. So we have a, um, and thank you for, for going more in depth than that. We have a, a question from one of our viewers. Uh, what was the role of lawyers in working with Evers? I didn't quite hear. What was the role of what? What was the role of lawyers working with Evers? Oh, yes, definitely. Because what, what Evers would actually have them do was represent a lot of the people who got in jail um, or who, um, you know, had some type of suit that they wanted to do. So he would use NAACP lawyers to actually represent those individuals. Those lawyers, which he told down in Biloxi, he said, if you told Mason and others, if you get in trouble, um, then make sure that you you talk to the NAACP leadership so that we can get lawyers down there to help you out. And those are the same thing that's going on down um, in Jackson and every place else. So they played an important role uh, for what Evers is actually trying to do. And so that's that legal aspect. So Evers is not only on the ground um, doing the activist piece, but he also is connected to the legal piece as well. And he's using them to kind of support these boycotters when things go awry. So that, that leads me to some things that we showcase in the uh, Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. One of the first cases that we kind of showcase um, in the museum is in Gallery 4, uh, A Closed Society. And we talk about the case uh, with Miss um, Gladys Noel Bates and uh, Megger Evers working with her with Argus Brown. And so we, we showcase those things. We showcase um, him working with Constance Baker Motley and mm -hmm. Argus Brown with uh, James Meredith case and getting in, uh, integrating the University of Mississippi. So uh, these things that people don't necessarily know right off the bat, you know, they're thinking that large uh, things are going on and, and people uh, with bigger names are involved. But as we showcase through the museum and as you showcase through your presentation, Megger Evers is, ha has his hand on the plow. Um, he may not be looking for the credit, uh, the credit but he is actually making things work. So could you talk more into about like how he is orchestrating uh, things behind the scenes um, necessarily? Yeah, because that's the nature of his leadership is that he wants to empower people to take on these types of things themselves as well. And he's there to provide his expertise you know, in terms of not necessarily being out in front, but actually provide expertise for them to go and do the things that he needs them to do. Or that they want to do his he see his role is showing them how these things are and providing the resources and once those resources are provided then he looks back and and watch individuals go and once they run into trouble then he provides additional resources in that area as well and so in terms of his leadership he's not really a person who's going to be out there in front as much matter of fact when he's going in the south and many times he's undercover because he knows if people find out who he is they're going to kill him so he's doing things undercover Right? With those students, he's also talking to them. This is your responsibility. These are the things that you need to do. I can show you how to strategize. You know, I can provide you with resources. I can con contact the media. With Glass Nose Bates, I can provide lawyers. With James Meredith, Argus Brown and others, but also Thurgood Marshall. You know? So he's a person in terms of which he wants people to empower themselves to get done what they want to get done. And his role is simply to provide uh, resources and advice and then when it comes time for him to be out there as well, he's not afraid of that. That's what happened, too, when he's out there marching on Capitol Street, too. He's not afraid to get out there involved, but he wants the community. This is a community thing. And this goes back to his parents. You know, when they say you are responsible for the community, you know, and as a responsible for the community, that means that you are a part of the community. And whatever talents you have, whatever strength you have, you apply that for the benefit of the community. And the way to do that is to make sure that people have what they need when they challenge the system. Yes. Um, you, you, you mentioned the Capitol Street boycotts and, and how he was organizing things behind the scenes, but also not afraid to act. Uh, I know talking with Reverend uh, Edwin King, uh, who's still living and was a, a part of the movement and actually uh, or, uh, one of the uh, chaplains at Tougaloo College during this time, um, he had mentioned uh, many times to me and my colleagues that he was, or Mega Evers was orchestrating the um, Woolworth sit-ins, right? Uh, with Tougaloo students. And when the Tougaloo students were being beaten uh, by the students from Central High School, that, you know, Mega got word that things were going awry and he wanted to come down and be, and be with the students while they were being beaten. Uh, but 
uh, uh, Reverend King said, if you, if you come down here, they definitely will kill you. So I don't know if you know more about that story, but um, there, there are pictures of Reverend Edwin King actually there with those students uh, trying to protect them. But uh, Reverend King said that he deterred uh, Mega Evers from coming because he, just, he knew that he was going to be murdered at that point. Yeah, and, and Evers knows full well what's going on there. And he's actually there. He sees um, people who are documenting stuff but not doing anything about it. Right. And so his thing at that point is also to start getting on the horn with the NAACP and say, this is what's going on down here. And we need some resources and some assistance. All right. But this is the thing about whatever too that I want to be clear about is he understood that his life could be taken at any moment. That's not something that that deterred him from doing what it is that he had to do. Of course, you know, he wanted to put it off as long as possible. That's what King and Malcolm and others have said as well. But for Elvis, that wasn't something that deters him. That's why he spent so much time, when we talk about the, the human element, he spent so much time making sure that his children understood or knew how to protect themselves, making sure that um, his wife was going to be able to carry on in case he got killed. You know, so the, that's what those are the conversations that he's having. And so he's not afraid of that. And so when those students are, are going through what they're going through, Elvis is very close to the area. He knows exactly what's going on, and he knows who's involved. And so I definitely want to make sure that people understand that, that this isn't a person that's scared of anything. He's not fearful uh, at all. And oftentimes he is putting himself in harm's way, um, particularly after his much more public kind of, of push for things. And so people know exactly who he is. And so he knows he still goes in the heart of uh, these backwards Mississippi towns. And I'm from Mississippi. Uh, so I know what those towns look like at night. You know, when you got the gravel roads, they are dark, but he's still down there and he's learning how to drive at 90 miles an hour like it's nothing when people are behind him. This is something that he does constantly. So the fear of death isn't something that deter him from doing or, or, or maintaining his community commitments. And so I want to make sure that that's clear. Thank you for uh, clearing that up. Uh, we had, do have another question from our audience. Do you know uh, very much about the continued relationship and contact Mega Evers had with his family back in Decatur while active in the movement? That's a good question, too. And I'm not, I don't really know how often he, he got back to Decatur or how often he was with. I know family is extremely important to him and he did go back, but I'm not quite sure in terms of, you know, how strong that relationship or how often he went back to visit family that I'm not I'm not sure about. I got you. So. I do. You, we, we brought up in, uh, the Biloxi Beach weigh ins, and that's a story, an event that many Mississippians alike do not know about. Could you go more into, um, I guess, go more in depth with his relationship with Dr. Gilbert Mason? Um, we do at the museum actually have a razor that Mega Evers used and actually left at Dr. Mason's home um, a few weeks before his assassination. And so that that element shows that they had some type of closeness, but um, oh, yeah. you know more about that. Yeah, actually, they were they were really good friends. He he uh, met Gilbert Mason earlier and introduced to him, and he really respected Evers' commitment. You know, that's one thing that people looked at about Mega Evers, but they understood immediately that he was committed, um, that he was sincere, and that he wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. And so Dr. Mason really um, kind of appreciated that by him. They became fast friends. You know, whenever he went to Biloxi, he would go by and uh, meet with um, Dr. Mason. They would go out um, and, and eat and things of that nature. So he would go to his home. So they were very, very close. And as Dr. Mason noticed that it was Meg Evers who came in and helped organize the NWCP chapter there in Biloxi. And so when he got ready to contest this 26 miles of, of man-made beach that's there um, in which black people couldn't get on, um, one of the things that he was asking Mega Evers was advice about how to go about this, you know, and then Mega Evers was telling him, well, yeah, if you're going to do this, you have to make sure that this is something that you all want to do. And to know that when things happen, if it goes around, that you're going to have to call on the, the uh, assistance of the NAACP. And so because he saw Evers as a friend, when things started happening, he used Mega Evers as his contact and go between between the major NAACP leaders. All right? And so when you ask about how that was, Mega Evers not only was friends with, with him, but also people in the community of Lux as well. Remember, he's also there organizing people against um, this practice of not allowing black people to live wherever they wanted to. So he's there talking about residential segregation, too. He's there trying to help people get their children enrolled in school. All right, so he has a connection there. And so once 
Um, because remember that in the beginning, people are a little disturbed by the NAACP in Biloxi. They're not sure if they want the NAACP to get involved so much because of the potential violence and, and all the negativity that comes along with this kind of civil rights activism and, and white people at that time. But once things start to happen, they then, uh, Mason says, then we're going to, and what he talks about in terms of, we're going to turn the, the biggest, the baddest dog we have loose uh, on this area. And that was the NAACP. And because him and Mega Evers had a relationship, um, he knew he could, the, could depend upon Mega Evers to really kind of provide the advice he needed and to be there when he needed. So going back to your original question in terms of their, their friendship, yes, they had a real strong uh, relationship and a personal one. And then also, Dr. Mason also said that Mega Evers was a person of impeccable integrity. You know, and the only thing on his mind, and that's what he said, the only thing on his mind was the movement, was helping people. Everything else that wasn't a part of that, he had tunnel vision against. And that's something that when I sit down and talk with um, Dr. Mason, that's something that he kept coming up is that nothing else was going to sway him. You know, no amount of temptations, none of that stuff had anything to do with Evans. He was there for a job. It was for the people. It was to challenge injustice. And that's the that's the only thing that mattered to him. And people recognize that and they kind of um, kind of glammed on this one because of that. So, yeah, they had they had a strong friendship. And that's something that you also need to know, too about this movement, about this struggle, is that people are developing connections and relationships. Mega Evans knows a lot of these people who are being killed. He knows the people in Jackson. Gladys knows, but he knows these individuals. And so when things happen, and that's another part that you have to keep in mind too with this human element, is you know when the decisions that you're making, that people are going to follow your advice, that there's a possibility that somebody is going to get killed. But there's a larger issue here. And so it's not just him out there saying, go do this and go do that. He's telling people to do things that he's also going to do. But more importantly, he's telling th people to do things that he understands may cost them their lives. Yeah. And that's a powerful decision that you are making. But people are doing it because they say that Mega Evers is not going to do put us in any kind of harm's way that he's not willing to do. That he's not willing to put his family in as well. So there's this symbiotic relationship between Evers and the people who serve him, and they come to trust him. And that becomes extremely important for why he's so effective in Mississippi is because people trust him and they believe that his intentions are pure. Um, so we have another question by our um, audience. In your opinion, what was it about Evers that made him able to bring together the various organizations and styles of fighting for freedom rights? That's a good, very good question. And I would say what it was about him was his sincerity, you know, and his genuineness and his ability to talk to people and make sure that they understood that, yes, there are differences, but at the end of the day, we're all fighting for the same thing. So how can we best use our strategies and tactics that works in alignment? And so people looked at him and they saw that sincerity there. And so that, I think, was one of the, the most important parts of his leadership that people saw and that made him effective. Right. Now, did he agree with all of the tactics, everybody? Of course not. But at the end of the day, um, we're trying to get free. And you heard when he said, once we unite in that clip I played, mm -hmm. once we all unite in this, we'll be able to win this battle for free. And that's always on his mind. So when SNCC comes in and CORE comes in and the formulation of CORE 4 and all these, when these things happen, Evans is at the center of it, um, trying to make sure that everybody's able to kind of work together. All right? And so to the question, I think that's the major part of this, is his sincerity and his integrity above all, and his willingness to, to get in the fight with people. And if he's asking you and your family to do it, he and his family is also doing it as well. And, you know, people, people got to respect that. I agree. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting close to time, but I, I think people viewing are really engaged and, and um, want to know more. But before we close, I, I really would like for you to kind of go into your book, Mega Evers, Mississippi Martyr, and, and talk to us about that process, uh, how long it took, the research um, that happened, uh, especially here at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Wonderful, yes. Um, and I know we just got a few minutes too, but the, the, the book project actually, and, and, I, and my mother is extremely important in this because when we grew up, she was always talking about Meg Evers. 
always talking about him and how important he was and he didn't get the necessary recognition. And so when I went to graduate school, um, I was in a course and we had to write about an uh, uh, individual and I hadn't made my selection. So the professor asked me, hey, have you heard of a person by the name of Meg Evers? And at that point, it's all kiss me. And so I started that that paper started as a 25 page paper uh, in graduate school. And then it went on to become the dissertation and went on to become the book. So that's 2003 when I got started. The book was published in 2011. What I really wanted to do was look at a holistic view of, of Mega Everest and the movement itself, who he was as an individual, who he was as a, as a father, as a son, as a friend. You know, what was his leadership style like? And so I wanted to get at that um, from a holistic perspective. And so I did a lot of research, a lot of interviews with individuals who were went to grade school with him, uh, went to college with him, um, individuals who worked with him in terms of his, his leadership status in the state of um, Mississippi. And so I did all those interviews. Also interviews with his family, with his brother, uh, Mr. Charles Evers, with his wife, Ms. Merle Evers Williams, you know, so with his sister uh, also. So I did, I got the family aspect of it too. And then did a lot of research with the Mississippi Department of Archives and his, with the uh, Met, uh, Mega Evers and Merle Beasley papers too, which was extremely important. And so able using that and then going to DC to look at the NAACP papers there as well, all right? And so looking at it from all those perspectives was what really went into the book intent, as well as a lot of secondary and other primary sources as well. But that's kind of the approach that I took for the book itself. And at the end of the day, I wanted it to be accessible so that people come away understanding not only how important Evans was to the civil rights movement, but how important the civil rights movement and all those who was in it, not only in Mississippi, but everywhere else from a human perspective, you know, not just Mega Evans as a leader, but Megan Evers trying to stay alive so he can come home to his family. You know, those are the things that I really want to do. What does that look like when you have to tell your son and daughter what's the safest place in the house if somebody starts shooting in the house? And you have to teach them that. You know, when you have to go to another part of Mississippi and you look at a person who's been um, murdered or a woman and you sitting across from her talking about her and she's talking about how she's been raped. Those are the kind of things that I want to get at. What does that do to a person? How does a person react to that so that after people read the book, they get a, a, a fuller understanding of the importance of Mega Wilder Evans, his humanity, but also the humanity of all those who are involved in civil rights struggle. And so that's kind of how I approach the book and, and a lot of the ways that I wanted people to be able to kind of receive. Well, thank you so much for, for going into that and explaining your, your process. I do want to be clear that we actually do sell uh, Mega Evers Mississippi Martyr at the two Mississippi Museum stores. So, um, you know, we're practicing uh, social distancing um, procedures here. So if you want to come down to the museum and purchase the book from us, you can, or I'm sure you can find it wherever other uh, books are sold in other places. Uh, but if you want to give proceeds to the museum, we would love that and uh, support Dr. Williams and his awesome work uh, studying and, and also uncovering and sharing the story and life of Mega Evers. Um, in closing, I do want to thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, for just giving your time and, and just sweat equity into this program. Uh, you really have uncovered a lot of things, I'm sure, for people who may have just heard of Mega Evers or didn't know about Mega Evers, but a lot of things that are not necessarily at the surface. So I appreciate you for taking a deep dive and really showing the examined life of Mega Evers. Um, I also want to thank our IT staff for uh, making this program uh, happen. Without them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these digital programs that we have now. So we, we thank them uh, tremendously. And also to my colleague, Bettina Okafor, who helped me out through the Q&As, through the Q&A session to relay the questions to you. Um, just a quick, uh, quick uh, housekeeping notes, uh, upcoming programs that we have uh, is Bearing Witness uh, Part 2. That will be on February 27th, and that will be on Facebook Live. This program is an auxiliary program enhancing our current I Am A Man photo exhibit. Uh, this will be a conversation with MDAH Executive Director Katie Blunt, two Mississippi Museums Director Pamela D.C. Jr., and Exhibit Curator Dr. William Ferris. And then on March 6th at 11 a.m., we have another I'm a Man uh, program called Thoughts of Yesterday. This is also an auxiliary program enhancing our I'm, I'm a Man exhibit. And this will be a discussion with uh, Mr. Frank Figures of One Voice and uh, Freedom Rider Hezekiah Watkins. And this program will be facilitated by fellow curator Roosevelt Hawkins. Um, before we go, I do want to give 
you know, you the floor, Dr. Williams, and just, you know, give you uh, words of uh, thanks or um, anything before we close. So. Um, yes, well, th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Spam, for that. And I want to thank you um, for inviting me to be a part of this program and for the work that, that, that you all do at the Mississippi Museum, too. I want to th thank everybody who, who logged in as well. But at the end of the day, I really want people to go back and really re-examine the kind of civil rights struggle and civil rights movement and look at it from this human element that I've talked about about this so that you get a fuller understanding of exactly what went into that. And then also your own responsibility to continue that forward. Meg Evers also talked about that. What we have a responsibility to the generations who are coming after us and to the generations unborn, we do as well. And Meg Evers is a prime example of, of what that looks like in the flesh on the ground. And so I invite people to not only look at him too, but also examine our own individual lives and what we need to do and how we can use our skill sets to further this movement for freedom. And so I thank you all for having the opportunity to, to be a part of this and for the discussion and for the questions. And so thank you again, Mr. Spann, for everything that you all are doing. Thank you again, Dr. Williams. And thank you all for tuning in. And we hope to see you again under the light. All right.